quickly. Yay! So, uh, um, so for those of you who don't know who Stephen is, um, he works down the local greengrocers from me and just wanted to bring him in and talk about vegetables and things like that. I think that's okay, isn't it, Stephen? I think that's just a bit spot on. I know about as yeah. much. I, I probably know about as much about vegetables as I do whiskey. To be fair. Well, that's it. I mean, I know we visited the distillery well last year, and yeah, it was as boring as hell. Um, but no, serious no. Um, so I first met you, Stephen. I think we spoke on Twitter for about three or four years, and yeah, um, we spoke to you about coming and having a, a visit to Deanston Distillery once you moved in there and we told you we'd get there for about nine o'clock and we set off at midnight and met you in the back at about seven o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> which which doesn't sound remotely are, sinister does it? No exactly you know uh, three guys in a car park at seven o'clock in the morning outside a whiskey distillery. Um, <laughs> in, in rural Scotland, I mean, that doesn't sound nothing, odd at all. Nothing dodgy there. No, nothing no. dodgy at all. Um, and you then went on to sort of give us a quick tour of the distillery, which I think took five hours. Um, and what? I think me and Ed would both agree that you actually spoiled our holiday totally by giving us the... It was all downhill after that. It was all downhill. <laughs> the best damn best tour, tour we of, had. of the distillery of that week. And it was just so much information and so much mind-blowing stuff that, you know, we just had to get you on here. And I know we spoke a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago, actually now, about yeah. getting you on. And, you know, obviously we had to wait, but... Um, Please, would you sort of give us a quick introduction to who you are um, and what you do? Sure. Well, I mean, name is Stephen Woodcock, and I am the distilleries manager for, for Distel International. So, um, Distel being a, a large South African company who are predominantly uh, cider makers and vintners. So, in 2013, they bought uh, a, a small Scottish company called Burn Stewart Lock stock and barrel um, and that includes uh, and pardon the pun uh, lock stock and barrel but uh, but that includes the three distilleries um, Tobermory on the Isle of Mull, Deanston on the mainland just outside Stirling and Bunahaben on the, uh, the Isle of Isla so um, I joined the company in 2016 would you believe four years and one day ago exactly and uh, I, I, I basically look after um, all four, uh, all four, all three distilleries. Um, so responsible for the, the procurement of the grain, procurement of the yeast, the, the, the entire uh, distillation process. And since January, um, since uh, you know, a, our colleague uh, Kirsty McCallum uh, left, then I'm now responsible for maturing stocks and blending as well. Which uh, I don't ask me too diff too too many difficult questions about mature whiskey, please. It is not my expertise, <laughs> but I overlook the I oversee the team that uh, that that look after uh, look after that particular of Jesus. Uh, yeah. So I know when we visited, um, one of the sort of big things that got me was we was talking about the water wheels and that and the fact that Kingston yes. was once um, all, all water powered basically. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the history of the distillery then? Sure. I, I mean, Deanston, is, is, it's a bit unique in, in, in so far as it's not a purpose-built distillery. So there's been a building in the grounds since about the 1780s. Um, the building, the big iconic red sandstone building that sits there now has been there just about from the turn of the 19th century. And it, it, it was an old cotton mill. Um, now, it, it, energy clearly, you know, and, and, and where energy comes from has changed over the centuries. But... Uh, but back in the day, it was uh, totally water driven. So uh, to take the, the water from the River Teeth, the, uh, the, the engineers of the day cut a, a lead, like a canal um, or a levee, however you, you, you choose to know that. It's a mile long, it's 30 feet wide, and it's six feet deep. And that all the, 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 the water to what would have been the mill at the time. And it would have powered these massive, great big water wheels. And those water wheels through um, a, a complex series of cogs, wheels, shafts would have powered all the looms um, and the mills. So that ran 
very successfully for about 150 years until it just became unec uneconomic to do it. And, uh, you know, there was a, a, a chap whose name always, Brodie Hepburn, there we go, who owned Tullibarden Distillery, which is just up the road, about 13 miles up the road from us, saw a great deal of potential. Mainly, I think, initially for vacuity, because once you take all these looms out, you just have shitloads of, of, of available space. So lots of lovely space to start maturing whiskey, but when you actually start to look at the surrounding area, you know, you can get yeast from about 10 miles away. The barley grows almost all around us, and, and there's a, an endless supply of water, lovely soft water, I should say, um, out the front door, which, of course, the kind of, uh, the, the, the forebears had had, uh, had dug this uh, laid for us to bring all this water. So all the raw materials were there to, to put together a distillery, and that's what they did in the mid-60s. Deanston has run for all but for a, a, a small uh, fallow spell in the 1980s consistently since. And it's uh, a, a fantastic, it's a new make, and, and, and most people that know me, my passion, always sits around the production of, of quality new make spirit. And... Uh, you know that 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 new make is just uh, it's just a phenomenal product. You know it's it's almost unique in Scotland. It's a very very unique new make, so very very popular with uh, with blenders. We do uh, sell and trade an awful lot of it annually. And I mean, one thing you know that struck me when we came. Obviously, we're talking about the the canal as we would call it being built. Yeah. And I think it's a mile long, and it's dropped. Was it three inches over the mile? That's right. It, I'm told it drops an inch over that mile just inch, to give yeah. you a nice constant flow. Yeah. Um, I mean, clearly now, uh, you know, we don't have uh, we don't have water wheels now. So uh, I think um, I, I'm reasonably sure Deanston is, is unique in Scotland insofar as it's the only distillery that now drives or, or gets all its uh, electrical energy from from hydroelectric energy. Yeah. So they they. Water wheels were taken out in the 1940s and hydroelectric generators were put in and we still use them. Uh, we still use that energy generation today. Yeah, I was, I was just about to say, I, I believe you are still with the water side to power yeah. it. And, you know, what, what gets me is that, like you say, the, the building wasn't necessarily built to be a distillery and you, no. you drive up to it, but it still kind of does look like a distillery. You know, you still get that feel of it being a distillery. I, I mean, I've never really kind of, I suppose I, I, I turn around that corner every day because you'll know if anyone who's driven to Deanston knows it's a big sweeping corner and all of a sudden this lovely great big building is just set before you. And I suppose, um, you know, just because I, I, I've i always associated it with being a distillery, you're right, it's, it's always, I think, I don't know whether or not it's just a great big stone building in the middle of rural Scotland, you automatically think, well, that's either a castle or a distillery, you know, the one or two things, you know. Um, so, I, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, the minute you set foot inside it, there's obviously the sights, the smells, the copper, the mash tun, the fermenters, you know, there's all the, all the things that give it away as, yeah. uh, as a fully functioning distillery. I mean, that's it, you, you know, like you say, as you drive up to it, it's quite an imposing building. The only thing kind of missing is either the white walls or the pagodas, but it, it doesn't really need that. No, no, I mean, it's, it's a building with phenomenal character and, and what I quite like is, you know, it's... Uh, it's it's 200 years old that building and and you know it's as good as the day it went up and and it's still a building that people will be talking about 200 years you know from now because it's just so imposing i mean it's it's so big we only use the distillery um the distillery only used the, the, the bottom two floors in that mm. so there's four floors um above that are just completely redundant and you know you can get some fantastic pictures uh, up there because uh, you know that, that nothing has changed since the looms were taken out in the 1960s. They're they're, they're quite eerie, and there is uh, uh, there's definitely a presence about them. That uh, as a, as a grown man of about six foot and, and, and fourteen odd stone, I don't go up there on my own. I just don't like it. You can uh, <laughs> you can sense that you know there's a real tangible feel to the past and. And yeah. we, uh, we, we, we're, we're thinking, I mean, this year it probably won't happen, but we actually are, uh, we're, our visitor centre colleagues actually giving some thought to, um, you know, kind of ghost tours. We had, uh, we had some temporary labour in uh, not that long ago to help in the warehouse and shifting some casks. And this chap happened to be a medium. And he was telling us that there were all sorts of forces and spirits and ghosties up there. So I think it's, it's interesting. You know, I've, I've certainly um, heard the odd, the odd thing that you think that, that, that can't be right, you know, and it's, uh, um, yeah, I think uh, I definitely believe in ghosts from one or two things I've, I've heard creeping about that distillery, the, the kind of, you know, early in the morning and what have you. 
I think that was just me and Ed trying to get to the new make. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, and again, I, I think the story with Deanston um, is, a, is very similar to the story that we had last week with Ian from Glen Scotia, where it's an absolute fantastic liquid. And those yeah. that know about whiskey know about Deanston, but it's still not on the tip of everybody's tongue. You know, you, you talk about whiskies, and Deanston isn't necessarily one of the first ones to come out there. And it's strange because it's such good liquid. That's right. And, and you know, it was a conversation I was having with my boss a couple of weeks ago where it is, it just doesn't have that presence. But you know, as an organisation, we're kind of big but we're not really that big. You know, we're, 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 we don't produce enough liquid to get real listings with, with, with supermarkets. And, and, you know, I suppose because that's where, let's face it, the majority of people will spend their time, um, you know, browsing, browsing aisles. And, uh, and, and it's just a shame. We just don't be able to, 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 you know, we're just not able to hit that, that, that scale, sadly. Mm. But, uh, do you know, I think I'm quite happy to come on to, you know, formats like this and, and forums and, and, and talk away and just try and sell the, the, the good word at Deanston because it is, I mean, it's an absolute, for me, the fundamental of every whiskey um, is, is the starting point's got to be a strong foundation in that shape. After that, of course, how you mature it and, and, and how that new mate then talks to the, talks to the wood. Uh, you know, and, and Deanston just lends itself so well to, to so many maturations and also so much, so many finishes as well, just because it's a beautiful unique. Really, and, and again, at the offset, we don't have that, that volume available to us because, uh, because I'm picking my hair out of my eyes now. Um, <laughs> because, you know, it, it, it's in such demand. You know, we, we trade and sell to, to all the big players in the industry. Everyone uses, you know, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be blends the world over using Deanston um, without a shadow of a doubt. That's it. And I mean, you know, obviously one of the the main things that we say about producing good whiskey is it, it's got to have a very good start. And the new make from Deanston, it, it has that presence there already. It does. I mean, do you know, I mean, we're, we're very lucky. Like I say, you know, it's, it's lovely. Um, you know, it's lovely soft water. Uh, you know, I I drive where I can to go out and, and, and you know, we, we, we talk to maltsters. Uh, the maltsters talk to the farmers. We, we'll go out, uh, and, and again, COVID will just completely ruin that this year. But, you know, can around about typically July time, we'll go out and have conversations and uh, and just see how the, 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 the barley's performing in the field. And that then starts to allow you to think about any changes you might want to make to your malt spec um, you know, for the coming year after the harvest comes in. And, and I think just because we give that, that bit of care and attention to it, and, and I'm, you know, I see um, distillation as a vacation. It's not something that I, I'd probably do it for free. I, I think, you know, I just, I just love what I do. And, mm. and, and you know, I, I think if, if, uh, if you try someone who came from another planet, that you take the same three things to make one thing, and you do that every day. You don't do anything else. You just use the same three raw materials to make the same one end product. You know, you would actually probably, you know, somebody might actually position distill distillation somewhere above stamp licking as a profession. How complex can it be? But, you know, you look at the 120 odd functioning distilleries in Scotland, and each one has, or in England or in Wales or globally, and each one has its own unique character. I just find, you know, these are the things that you want to get in and out. These are the nuts and bolts you want to you want to understand. And once you actually find the heartbeat of your distillery, and, and we had to look long and hard when I kind of first started at Deanston, just to get that that uh, you know that that heart. It, it, it's an expression I used, you know, just trying to tie your your, your mashing cycle with your fermentation, with your with your distillation to to get it all to. to to get the new makes, but once you get there, don't change a thing. Just keep it as it is, and it'll work all day for you. And and, and I think once we got that kind of nailed, it's uh, you know, like I say, it's a, it's a beautiful new make. Yeah, I mean that was one thing that it set me going because I know before I visited Deanston and talking to you, I didn't sort of probably appreciate how how big an impact the distillation has on producing that liquid. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it really is. And, and listening to you on that on that tour that we did, I think we spent probably two hours talking about distillation and, and the project. And it, it was just fascinating that, like you say, such a simple kind of process is 
absolutely mind-blowing of, of mm -hmm. how much impact it can have. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the complexities at each stage, and, and don't get me wrong, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not, a, you know, I'm certainly not a master of it, but, you know, there are, there are, there are elements in the process that we must hit, and, and, you know, we must get a nice, um, you know, we must get a nice, clear, really light, really refined, really sugary wort, and, and we, we also want something, I, I'm a fan, you know, I know the, the kind of bigger um, distillers now are a bit high gravity because it's efficient and you know you get more bang for your buck but easily you know I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of a low gravity fermentation because you create more esters you get a more estery wash um, uh, uh, once, once fermentation is complete and of course those fruity esters will just build into that lovely light refined new mate spirit when it comes off the end of the still um, you know I want a reasonably long fermentation I'm looking for something round about the kind of 80 odd hour mark again just to let it kind of um, oh well, take a step back. If, if, if I wanted a cloudy wort, which I can't can have, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, you, you, you'll tend to get something that's a bit nutty and cereally, cereally coming through in your new make spirit. You, you won't really get much beyond that. The nice, lighter, clearer your wort becomes, the, 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 the more ester formation you'll get. So you'll get something a bit fruitier, fruitier a bit sweeter. And the, the the fermentation will develop through that process, so everything will kind of start nutty serially. Then it'll start to sweeten up. You'll get something that, as a new mate spirit, would give you something quite grassy, or well, fresh cut hay, then grassy, then light, then fruity, and 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 it's the kind of fruitiness I'm really aiming for. And then you put it into these beautiful stills, and you know, big big bodies, boiling balls. You know, they're not there for for decoration. The influence. The character of the spirit it's about copper surface area it's also about when you think of the vapor rising up the side of that still so it goes up around the body and the body gets thinner so it gets quicker and as it as the vapor gets quicker it opens up into this boiling ball and it slows down the velocity drops and and that drop in speed also um allows the boiling point of that because it's a whole relationship in thermodynamics that people know 10 times more about than I do, but it lets the heavier elements drop back out into the still and the lighter elements, the lighter um, congeners, the lighter vapors to rise up the still, more copper contact, big long incline lie pipes. So we're making that spirit work all the time. And uh, you know, that gives us that nice, lovely, beautiful, light refined spirit we get. And of course, that's just the wash distillation, the spirit distillation, stills are the same design. We're looking for exactly the same process again. Uh, to give us just that lovely light, nice, like I say, refined, fruity spirit. And once you get that kind of foundation, it works just with so many cast types. You know, it's such a, uh, a, a flexible spirit. Well, that was, that was actually, I was just about to say to you, the fact that the spirit from Deanston does work with so many different casks. It does. It works. I mean, the, the one we use most and, and would obviously be part of our kind of, well, our introductory offering would be would be virgin oak, or would be uh, you know in age statement terms it would be the, it would be the twelve year old, um, but uh, you know we 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 mature it for its its full life in, in bourbon because that nice light sweet uh, fruity spirit works incredibly well with the characteristics that will come with first fill bourbon. They marry together absolutely beautifully, uh, you know. And you get hints of honey, hints of barley sugar. Um, you know, it's just uh, a, a fantastic, uh, easy drinking whiskey. So again, and you know, you if you get um, even in refill, uh, Dean, uh, Deanston will work reasonably well with that. And uh, you know, take it out of refill and give it a finish. It'll work with a whole raft of uh, of finishes of sherries. Um, you know, it's it's just a phenomenally flexible spirit. Yeah, and I mean that was since you sort of mentioned sort of finishing because at the moment I'm drinking your 2002 organic oloroso finish. Yeah. Uh, what made you decide to do an oloroso in organic rather than a general oloroso? Well, do you know that the, the, there was, I mean, well, we, we were one of the first, and this is a way beyond my time with, it, with, with the business, but of course, we've been distilling organic whiskey since about the year 2000. Mm. And, uh, do you know, it, it's simply by definition, um, it's, it's a very light whiskey. It's a very, it's a very easy drinking whiskey, but it's not the most complex of, of whiskies. And, you know, if you want to try and put a wee bit of a, a wee bit of a spin on it, then, of course, we have to go and look for organic uh, you know, organic products that were aged in oak that we can use, um, uh, you know, to keep the, the, the organic status. 
and an organic an organic Oloroso was quite simply one of the first organic sherries we stumbled across. So um, decided to use that, and and I have to say, um, I think I think it lifts that expression beautifully. I think it really does. You know, it's it's sometimes in in, in whiskies finishes are almost like bolt-ons. You mm -hmm. know, they're almost like add-ons, and the uh, you know you get you get the, the the underlying notes of either the, the the first maturation or you might get the new make and then bang there's the finish but i think it's a seamless flow on that mm -hmm. or, 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 or the organic color so they just seem to work together really really well um, so, so yeah it, sorry sorry on you go yeah i was just about to say so the 2002 is organic bourbon matured and then organic oloroso or is it is it normal oh. spirit into Oloroso, organic Oloroso. What we what we did um, earlier, uh, well, well, I know what to get the organic status was that you would take bourbon wood and you would flail it. So you would take those casks into the cooperage and it's like a great big spinning wire brush that takes it straight back to new wood. Yeah. Um, do you know, it's, it's, it's probably a bit, I don't know whether I would say use the word ropey, but I'm not overly convinced by it. So what we try to do now is bring in brand new casks they've had nothing in them before um it's new wood and we'll use that so again you're you're you're, you're organic it can't be challenged it can't be you know the status is the status is sound um mm -hmm. so that's what we use now is new wood and i take it then when you make organic whiskey it's a full clean down afterwards then oh i do you know i hate it i have to say i hate it it's yeah. a pain in the neck because yeah we have to uh, we have to uh, strip the distillery down. So, I mean, it's 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 a bit common sense. I mean, we don't make an awful lot. So what we'll tend to do is one malt bin, we will clean down. One grist bin, we will clean down. And then the rest of the process obviously has to be gutted beyond that. Uh, the, the, the regular faints will be removed. The tank will be cleaned down. And then we can, you know, we can then move on. Moving from organic back to regular Deanston is less of a problem because yeah. that's we can just let the, the, the process flow. So we're actually um, we're actually producing organic spirit just now. So uh, COVID obviously uh, we as a business took the took the decision to close our distilleries down. Uh, we have just started to reopen. So the best time for us to make organic is typically once the distillery's been off because that gives us a, a great opportunity to get everything cleaned down to the, the standard where we can then safely make it without any risk of, uh, of, of contamination. Yeah, and I mean, one of the sort of things that have come up recently and slightly going away from Deanston, which I wasn't going to do, but since you've already mentioned that you're looking after them all then. Um, yeah. One thing that I've noticed recently is um, Ledgig um, coming out as unpeated. So obviously, I was always under the impression that the Turbomari was the unpeated, Legic was the yeah. peated. So how come yeah. we're now seeing unpeated Legic? Because up until, I think it was about the 1970s, it was Legic Distillery. Yeah. So we, we still have some, uh, we still have some inventory that was Legic. Legic was the spirit that the distillery produced. Um, and it's only since Burn Stewart took over that Tobermory was the unpeated spirit and Leitchik. So how we have to then differentiate that in our, our management system is that we actually have to call it Flechik. So we have to put peated Leitchik, P in front of the Leitchik, so that we can differentiate between the two. So back in the 70s, all the spirit was called was called Leitchik. It's, yeah. uh, it's as simple as that. So in theory, anything that's coming out as unpeated Leitchik today could be from the 70s then? Yeah, most likely. Um, I think, uh, although my history might be a bit sketchy in this, I think it was about 79, 80. It changed its name from Leitchick Distillery to, to Tobermory. Yeah. And so... We, we, have, a, we have an unpeated lead jig that's 23-year-old, yeah. and I think it was casked incorrectly. I remember you, because you, I've, I've tried it, Dave, because this was the bottle you accosted me with in China, wasn't it? I think we were in China at the time. Was it? Or was it a photograph you had? I don't think it was a sample of the whiskey, actually. It might just have been a photograph you had when we were in uh, Shanghai um, last year. Uh, we've got some... Yes, we yes we have got some um, unpeated Lidgig. Just one bottling. But I think that was at that beginning when Burn Stewart took over right. um, and maybe ran out of casks or something because it was filled into a Lidgig cask. And, nice. and then later it had been stenciled unpeated afterwards. I think that was a 90... Yeah. 95 it's either a 93 or a 95 i can't remember yeah. i've got the photo on my phone somewhere 
That's right. I've seen it. Yeah, but I, I have no explanation for that at, no. <laughs> at all. Um, before your time, yeah, yeah, before my, but uh, but certainly, you know, back in the day, uh, everything that came out was 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 Leachick because uh, that was the name of the distillery. So, um, fingers crossed, we don't make the same mistake again. Please. <laughs> So, I mean, jumping back to um, to the Deanston, um, one thing that really struck us when we came around was uh, the warehouse and that yeah. fantastic warehouse with the vaulted ceilings. And, you know, yeah. for, for those that don't know about it, you know, it, it's, it, a, stunning it's, a, it's a stunning <laughs> scenery as you walk in. Yeah. Do you know, you, you could talk about mashing and fermentation and you could talk about lovely copper stills in a still house all day that's still my favorite part of the tour because you i just i don't think anyone who hasn't seen it um could, could even begin to imagine what's going to sit before them um you know when you open that door and and, mm. and then you go and there is this old weaving shed you know and it's uh, and the story the story behind it's uh, phenomenal you know it was um back in the day uh, you know if you could imagine 1500 looms all running and uh cotton is best woven i think it's about 18 19 celsius something like i think the temperature i mentioned changes every time because the truth i don't know but there's, there's a fixed temperature and uh and you know you didn't need any artificial heating in there anything like that it maintained you know all the bodies in there and the looms working away held that temperature quite comfortably but of course people sweat so what would happen was the sweat would rise and then it would cool and condense, but you couldn't have it dripping back. So you've got these beautiful arched vaulted ceilings that would take it away to pillars and then it would run down and onto the floor. I don't quite know what unlucky so I'd get the job to mop that up. I don't think I would have liked it, you know. But no. but also up on the roof, it was, uh, and I always have a wee dig at my cal in it, although I shouldn't, but, but you know, we, we go the, on. the roof was... <laughs> Oh, can you go there? The roof, the roof was planted up, so we had soil and grass um, plant, oh, you know, on top of that 200 years ago, because of course it kept the heat in and it kept the noise in as well, because of course Deanston Village is only a matter of yards away, so mm. rather than uh, upset the, uh, the local villagers, it was all planted up on top, and where the big vaults come down, then they would plant up vegetables, potatoes and leeks and, and onions and what have you. So you could actually go up there and harvest something for tea as well. So a sight to see, sadly all gone now, all removed in about the 1940s. So, um, but uh, yeah, we were, we were we were putting grass over roots 200 years before McAllen were doing it. So, so uh, what are you telling us then? Basically, you're the original Teletubby land. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> we thought it first. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, and the other thing that struck me, and I could be wrong here, but it's not a floor, it's not the ground floor, is it? Well, the topography is a bit weird. It's when you move towards the, 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 the warehouses three and four. Um, so when you stand in warehouse two, you're actually on kind of terra firma. But as you move through into the racked warehouses, then you've got warehouses on top of warehouses. So warehouse yeah. three actually sits, which is racked. It's on top of warehouse four, which is dunnage um, below it. So, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, um, you know, if, if you can't act up, I mean, I've worked there long enough to picture it in my head now. But actually, when you think, well, we're on ground here, but if we move next door, we've actually got a warehouse below our feet. So it's a, a real kind of hodgepodge, which just takes advantage of the, the topography of the, the ground it's built on, you know. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, the other thing that struck us, which um, I'm pretty sure you told us you were going to change, was the blue doors. Weren't you going to paint them green and white? Oh, no chance. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep them blue for now, because, of course, we're all Everton fans in, in, in Scotland, you know? Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Um, so, I mean, getting back to the, to the sort of whiskey side of it, um, yeah. what would you say is the defining character of Deanston Liquid? Well, as as a mature liquid or a new make, uh, either you saw both probably. Right. Okay. Oh, right. So I so let's start with a new make. I mean, the, it, it it's kind of I suppose internationally known as a kind of waxy new make. So the the, the new make um gives off this note, which is almost like waxy stems from the kind of barber jacket type nose, um, a bit of a minerally note, uh, but but sweet and a bit fruity. Um, you know, there's only a, a, a kind of couple of other distilleries come come close to, to Deanston's character. One being um, uh, Cl Klein Leash in Highland and Dalhoun on Speyside. 
Um, but uh, but but they t- they have very very similar characteristics. But kind of Deanston's a kind of stand out there. And and when it comes comes through into a new make, then I'm not massive on these lengthy descriptors. It's lovely. It's sweet. There's a nice kind of honey barley sugar base to, to Deanston, which uh, you know can can just take you off and 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 you know you can explore umpteen different routes with that foundation when you start to you know explore finishes, whether they're sherry finishes, whether they're wine finishes, or you know what uh, whatever we're putting uh, whatever we happen to put Deanston into to either mature or finish with. But it's it's a beautifully adaptable spirit. Yeah, and I mean you know like we said earlier that. It does lend itself to basically any cast that you seem to put it in. It just seems to work. Uh, it just works. I mean, again, I'd, I'd love to understand. I mean, maturation, um, whilst I'll talk about it all day, is, isn't a strong suit. But uh, it just seems, uh, you know, it, it, it just seems to be, it, like I say, I, I think adaptable is probably about the best word I can come up to describe, uh, you know, it, it needs to spirit. It just, it doesn't matter what we put it in. It just seems to work, you know, and, and and I'd be lying if I said I like them all. You know, I, I see a lot of people rave about, you know, we have some red wine matured and we have some red wine finished uh, expressions and, and they're not, you know, I think they can dry it up a wee bit, I make it a wee bit bitter, but, you know, I hear so many people say so many good things about them that, um, you know, I, I prefer Dean's to get into something perhaps a bit sweeter. Uh, bourbon or, or a nice Oloroso or a PX. I mean, mm. good God, the, the, the Deanston 10-year-old PX was just absolutely outstanding. Um, yeah. And it just seems to, you know, it just seems to work so well. It just seems to tell a story. Yeah, and I think that's that's the thing with Deanston, that we, we all talk about the stories and, and the journeys that whiskey takes. And Deanston is a relatively new distillery in the sense of 1965. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not old, okay. it's not got a massive history as a whiskey nope. distillery, but it all just seems to come together and, and it just seems to marry together perfectly to, to give you that story of what it used to be, to, the story of what it is now, and the, and the spirit just carries that sort of story on. Yeah, it does. And, you know, it, it'll... I think almost the kind of uniqueness of it as well, I'll, I'll forever carry that on. It doesn't really, in my mind, get lost lost in the crowd. You know, there's, no. there's something slight individually, you know, there's something quite individual to it. And, and, and you know, that as well, just, uh, it, it just works so much in its favour. Yeah, and, and sort of the other thing, obviously, going back to your sort of strengths, well, obviously the distillation side of it, uh, I think one topic that's come up a lot recently is, is just how much influence the distillation sector has on the final taste and whether it's it's yeah. the dominant sort of side or whether it's you know the the materials you're getting in or whether it's the cask maturation so from from your point of view who's done a lot of distillation you know where do you think the biggest strengths are in distillation to giving you that flavor profiles well it's it, it probably everywhere has a part to play and, and and it's really just down to the profile you want so if you want something quite quite nutty and cereally, and, and you know, that's what Bells do, and Bells are good at it. I've, I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough in my time to manage most of Bells Distillery. You don't want to mess about in the mash tun. You just want a, a you know, you want a, a good ex, a good extract, but a, a cloudy wort works fine. So, uh, you know, that will then give you that nutty new make spirit. There is no point in wasting too much time on a, on a kind of cultured distillation, if you like, because you're not really going to influence that character um, particularly much. But, you know, like I say, if you want something nice, light, refined, fruity, nice, clear wort, you want to have a reasonably long fermentation and, you know, you want as much copper contact um, as well. But but again, you know, you've got to keep those clean still. You've got to distill it nice and slow. You've got to keep your, your copper well recovered. You know, you've got to make sure it's active when the distillation starts. Um, but, or you could go for, I don't know, something like maybe a Mortlach model where, you know, they, they have a wriggling kinchy or something like that. Well, they have they have quite dirty stills. You know, they're looking for that sulfur, heavier spirit. Um, so, you're, you know, you don't quite have the same copper contact. You've got worm tubs there because, again, you want quite a heavy, meaty spirit. It's it's down to, you know, really what you want from your distillery. And you just really design your, your process round about that. Um, like I say, if you want a heavy spirit for whatever reason, don't waste an awful lot of time in long fermentations and, you know, kind of slow runoffs from the tun and that type of stuff because you don't you don't need it. It's really what you want is a a distiller and uh, 
ultimately, I suppose, what you want your your final whiskey to be to be uh, to be like, you know. And this that's kind of a fascinating fact that you know it, it's it's yes, as a distiller, you come in and you obviously kind of got to go to what's being made and what the the house form is. But you know, how much influence as you as a person do you have uh, over the change of, of spirit style? Well, not not an awful lot. If I'm if I'm brutal, you know, I would like to have a lot of freedom. But but as I've said, you know, we we uh, we trade and, and sell a lot of Deanston um, because Deanston is used in so many blends. We, we you know, and I'm I'm not going to write them off, obviously. But the majority of the industry we do a bit of business with, and so consequently, if the customer wants a blue car, that's what you've got to give them. So mm. the, the the challenge the challenge is maintaining it. You know, it's it's Deanston. Um, in terms of a process, it's it's not. It's easy to get right when you know what you want from it, but but landing on, on that consistency, and that was the piece of work that, that I wanted to do. Um, one, one of the challenges I had when when I started four years ago was getting a consistent Deanston, and it's really looking at searching for that. I know it sounds a bit, a bit romantic, but it's searching for that heartbeat of the distillery. And once you find that, once you can knit everything together, um, to flow through in a way that suits the character of the spirit you want, then that's that that that's what works for me. You know, that's uh, that's really for um, you know that that that's what that's what you really want to chase down and get, and then the consistency is reasonably easy after that. And uh, have you done much experimentation with yeast in that then? Not an awful lot, to be fair. I mean, we 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 will move. Um, you know, we will look perhaps at what we want our yeast to do for us. And maybe we'll probably just take, in fact, we do, we'll, we will just take the strain, same strain from a number of different suppliers. Now, that might well be that a particular strain works better at elevated temperatures or it's a bit more tolerant around about pressure or phenols and, and you know, repeated expressions. But other than that, um, you know, we, we I, I, I can't do an awful lot of experimenting around that simply because, you know, like I say, because we trade so much at uh, Deanston when our, when our customer wants a blue car, that's what we have to sell them. <laughs> Yeah, so obviously going back to the fact that you kind of look after the three distilleries now, um, yeah. I know we've spoken about a few things, you know, with the distilleries, but which, which of those three actually kind of excite you the most with what you might be able to do or where it might go? Um, do you know, I think they're all they're all kind of different and they all bring something you know kind of different to the party around about that question so you look at Deanston I think Deanston's a bit of a, a, a an uncovered you know an undiscovered monster you know I think uh, I think once more people start to try and taste and explore a bit round about Deanston it is real potential to take off I think when you look at Tobermory I think Tobermory's got quite a niche following and, and, and I quite like the notion that it's quite niche you know because it's a a, a tiny wee distillery, you know, we're, we're usually only putting maybe about 650,000, 750,000 litres of new make out annually. So I, I, I think that that, that, that almost kind of niche value to it and that kind of that, that, that kind of core following, I think, really works. Um, so w would you want Tober Mori to suddenly explode onto the scene? I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure. I quite like where it sits at the minute. Mm -hmm. And, and Buna Haben, I mean, you know, who doesn't know? Who doesn't love Buna Haben? You know, I mean, we could sell 10 times what we make of that, quite simply. The biggest restriction we have is warehousing space. Yeah. So I think they all bring kind of slightly different, slightly different things to the game. Yeah, and I mean, what... Uh, go on. Do you mind if I go on? Yeah, go on. So, Stephen, earlier on you mentioned um, high and low gravity fermentation. What, what does yeah. that mean? Well, so the the the, the gravity, um, geez, here we go. It's it's gravity we measure is almost a term of density. So if you have uh, gravity of the gravity of water at, um, at twenty degrees is a thousand, right? One point zero zero zero. If you add sugar to that, which we extract from a mash tun, it gets denser. It gets heavier, if you like. So if you took um, if you took, for example, a uh, 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 ton of water at 20 degrees it will weigh a thousand kilos or a thousand liters will weigh a thousand kilos if you were to put sugar into that it gets denser the mass increases yeah. so if you so we will we will typically maybe kick off our fermentations round about about 1050 we call it 1.050 so uh, or a thousand and fifty you can express yeah. it any ways you want so if you took um, a cubic meter of that at 20 degrees it would weigh a thousand and fifty kilos so that's the kind of concept of gravity um, 
the lower the gravity, the, the, the higher levels of ester formation you will get during fermentation. So it's just how yeast, um, and I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a biochemist, so I, I can go to a point then I get stuck. But the way the yeast will behave at these kind of lower gravities will give you something a bit more estery, so a bit, a bit fruitier. And it's, it's an old trick for a Monday morning when I wander in for the first time up into the turn room and get a big noseful. And, you know, I've almost heard it described, some describe it as, you know, kind of yellow juicy fruit, uh, yes. chewing gum type smell, yeah. you know, that real, that real fruitiness. Um, if you've got that going, you know, you know the yeast's doing its thing. Um, the higher gravity is when you will, you will have much more sugar. Um, and the fermentation is far more efficient and it will give you a far higher alcohol yield. But, you know, in, in my personal opinion, I'd be reluctant to go that way because I think it would be at the expense of, of the quality of the wash. It would change the flavour profile. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. About, um, obviously, with Buna and Eddie's doing and to worry, all the, like, the, the core bottlings are at, at 46.3%. Which is obviously yeah. a bit, compared to other distilleries, yeah. um, it's not it's not is that you know is that point three does that make a big difference? Is it, how did you get to that sort of you know volume value if you will? It's it, it's it's an interesting story. So that would have been my predecessor, the the, the great Ian McMillan, that came up with the forty six point three, and of course uh, the driver behind that is the fact that we don't chill filter. It's as simple as that. So um, we don't chill filter because. Um, we firmly believe that uh, retaining those fats and oils. Now, in my mind, um, you know, we could argue all day whether or not chill filtration affects the, the, the flavour and taste. I, I happen to think not. Um, but what it does give you is because we retain those those fats and oils, you get a much more rounded mouthfeel in my mind. You know, almost a I call it a kind of three dimensional mouthfeel rather than something quite flat that just slips over the palate and down. Um, so. To take it a step back to why 46.3, when Ian was doing all this work, he landed on 46.3 being the one which he found just best expressed the liquid. It gave him the, 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 the best flavour profile. And uh, we need that elevated ABV um, simply to keep the, the fats and oils in solution at room temperature. That's where the clouding comes from. You know, you throw your you throw your ice in and all of a sudden your drink becomes cloudy. And, and, and sadly, you know, and, and not sadly, I suppose, but, you know, some consumers might see something non-chill filtered in a bit of a colder shop and think there's something wrong with it with the mm -hmm. spirit when in fact there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with it at all so there's that element of cosmetics in there which which we you know certainly in our, our single malt expressions just don't want to uh, we just don't want to get down that road you know i think you can appreciate the dram far better at 46.3 and uh um you know non-chill filtered so you get that nice rounded rounded feeling and uh and, and the palate of the the dram you know yeah, and I think that's one thing that, you know, the, I say the consumer, but I, you know, I kind of mean the people that are really, really into whiskey as, 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 a, as a product rather than it being just a drink. But, you know, that, that little bit more ABV, that little bit of, you know, non-chill filter, that natural colour, it, it's all an added bonus to us. Right. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's the spirit you're enjoying the spirit as, as we you know as, as we try it more so i suppose limited editions and distillery uh exclusives you know that come as cash strength i mean we firmly believe it's a line that our master our master uh blender julianne delivers and, and you know she's right it's we want you to taste it as we taste it you know as as, as it comes out the cask when we are sampling cast samples for uh, you know, for limited editions three or four years down the line or, or distillery expressions, then we firmly believe as well that, that cast strength is the way to go because we firmly believe that the consumer and, and uh, you know, should uh, should enjoy the spirit as as we do when we're, you know, it's a, it's a terrible job, isn't it, when you have to try spirit, try have, have to try whiskey for a living. Well, this is it. I mean, you know, sort of, you look at that and I know Dave, you know, he, he pulls his hair out of having to try whiskey as a job. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, I, I'm kind of getting there where I've got to keep trying products and yeah, it's a hard life, isn't it? People no, don't understand terrible. how much stress it causes. It's uh, it's murder. Usually by nine o'clock on a Monday, I've had about 20 whiskeys. Sadly, none of them I can drink, but uh, you know, you've, you've sadly with a day in front of you, you've got to, uh, you've got to use the spittoon, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm learning. I have to say I'm responsible for the kind of blending function, but I, I wouldn't say it's my core skill. So I'm, uh, but I'm, do you know what? I'm happy to learn. I mean, one quick question that's just come in, um, which I don't know whether you can answer, but when will we see the distillery editions this year from Bonnerhaven? Um, or has it been totally impacted with the COVID? No, situation? no. So we've been, um, now when they'll be released, I, I don't have that information, but uh, they're, they're queued up and they're ready. They've been, uh, yeah. if, if memory serves, they've been bottled. Yeah. Um, so they should be available very soon. I mean, that's one thing, obviously, that we have seen, you know, obviously, with especially with Isla, you know, things are getting hit left, right, and centre. Um, you know, and, and I, I know, sort of speaking to you, you know, there's been a few things, but you know, how is is, is everything kind of getting back to normal with the distilleries? Or uh, well, yes and no. So, so the distilleries are back up and running. So, so when 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 lockdown came, we took, um, you know, we took the, the the decision as a business to close our distilleries down and our visitor centres as well. Um, obviously, restrictions have been lifted, and you know you get a bit of time, quite simply, to sit and, and get your ducks in a row in terms of how you're going to function as a business, the controls you're going to need in place. Then, once you've got that that sorted, um, now we're coming we're coming back on to uh, we're coming back online. So, um, Tobermory and, and Bunahaben are about two weeks um, up and running, and Deanston went live on Friday, so they are all back up and running now. And is that the visit centre open at Deanston? Sad, sadly, yeah. not. Sorry, no. So until um, until we get some real clear guidance, I mean, we will obviously act under the guidance of um, the Scottish government and the SWA as well. Some of our colleagues in the industry have just taken uh, the, the the decision to to remain closed for the remainder yeah. of the year. Um, we we we'll act under the, the the guidance we're we're given. So um, you know, if we can start to tease things back over back over. over these things open slowly. That's exactly what we'll do. But clearly, do you know, I mean, it's it's all down to how we can uh, safely manage these. I mean, we're certainly not going to put profit before people's health and well-being. That's a certainty. So, no, exactly, um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll just see how the guidance goes. I saw in Twitter this morning that Perfadi have, have, have made the decision to remain closed for the rest of the, the rest of the year. I drive by Glen Farkless. Um, I'll be driving past there tomorrow morning. They've got signs up saying they'll be closed for the foreseeable. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just have to uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. So there's nothing planned yet. But again, as as we go through the phases of of uh, you know easing, then we'll, we'll we'll see what that brings. I would like to think we'd have something up and running um, by the by the end of the year. I would like to think, but you know, without yeah. a crystal ball, who knows. I mean, it is strange. I'm pretty sure in thinking that Glen Farkas were the first ones to actually say they won't open the visitor centre again this year. So, you know, I think it's, you're right. Hi. Yeah, it, it's it's very strange times. Um, you know, but I mean, has anybody else got any questions for Stephen? Um, I got one. Hands going up. Go on, Dave. Um, hi, hi, Stephen. How are you? Steve. Uh, uh, good man you yourself. Know, Two of the best tours I've ever been on would have been with you around Bunnahaven and Deanston with Dranbury Crowd. So, yeah, I've, I love your passion for distillation, and that's where it all really stems from. Are you going to get involved with Distel's Distillery in South Africa at all going forward? Because um, I know we all, we, we're all big fans over here, certainly of the Baines, and, and certainly, you know, I, when I went over to South Africa to do some boutique stuff, one of my primary goals there was to secure some um, boutique whiskey. And, uh -huh. you know, we've we, we got our first ever boutique three ships. Um, I think that was the first independently bottled. But really, I would love a boutique Baines because it just sort of rolls yeah. off the tongue. Uh, are you going to be involved in sorting out or sort of bringing their distillation techniques up so they can increase their capacity at all? They're, 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 to be honest, it's a short answer. There are no plans at the minute, Dave. But um, do you know, I, I would never rule it out. It's 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 kind of odd with with four years with the business, and I haven't even visited South Africa ah. yet. But uh, but you know, uh, Mister Watts guards his kingdom like uh, like you wouldn't believe. So it's uh, you know he's been over he's been over a few times, but I've never made it over to, to South Africa yet. But do you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't rule it out. I, I think it would be. Do you know, I think it would be uh, quite an interesting uh, combination of things. I think it'd be quite an interesting partnership, and I think it's something that's long overdue. I think it's something we should be thinking about. But I'm speaking to Andy in the morning, strangely enough, with uh, another issue to discuss, and, and, and sadly, it's the G word that's gin. So I'm, I'm speaking. I'll speak to him in the morning. So 
I need to try and wangle that and bite in the post somehow. <laughs> yeah, you need to. I do. Yeah, I, mean, I, think Dave, I think Dave literally just read my mind there. I was going to ask with Andy taking up his new role of head of uh, intrinsic whiskey at the Stell with yeah. his, his much collaboration. So I'll move on to a, a, a slightly uh, different question. So given that the, the sort of passion you've talked about, Deanston, um, and given that so much goes into the, the blend world, are you do you like where it is in terms in the whiskey world? Like it's more of a whiskey drinker's whiskey, or would you prefer it if you had that capacity to do more in this sort of single malt release sort of world? Do you know? I, th I think it it it's 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 a kind of twenty age sword. That do you know? You, I, I like where it sits just now, but but I think like everything else, I th you know, I think there's just not enough people out there drinking. To be fair, I think it needs. Um, Deanston certainly needs a, a bit of a bigger footprint out in the marketplace. So it, it would be lovely to see. Um, and again, there is the, the, I suppose, there is the capacity in Deanston to step up a wee bit if we had to. But I think it's just, uh, it's just trying to get that foothold. It's just trying to get people talking about it. You know, it's just trying to get it out of that niche. But, uh, but you know, it, it's, it, it is, it's, it's nice where it is and it's cosy where it is. But of course you do want, I think it, it sometimes struggles as a bit of a, as a brand and, and getting a bit of identity about it. And I suppose it's just really just trying to put your finger on what that is and how you can tap into it and, and, and make more of it. But uh, thankfully, um, probably off the back of that explanation, you'll be glad I'm not a marketeer. That's not, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, but, but yeah, it would be, it, I, I, I think it would be nice. I think it would be nice to wander down, see even, for example, a, a, a supermarket and see it up there with the bigger names. I think it would be lovely because, you know, I think we all know. I think I think you know we, it would hold its own as a liquid. It absolutely would. Yeah, I mean, I've I've had various. I mean, I've got. I'm drinking a boutique twenty year old at the moment, which is absolutely lovely. My one of my favourite sellers, Buddha Haven, which obviously uh -huh. has a lot of exposure. Um, but yeah. this is definitely something that you know, you know, from what I've had. Uh, you know, it, it does deserve sort of a bit. It's time in the spotlight, if you will. I I think so, and it's I I think it is just getting that exposure, and and you know I think that I think the route we need to take is 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 just more people talking about it because like I said, as a liquid, it certainly stands in its own. You know, it's it's uh you know um I mean I certainly look at maybe a Deanston 18 for example. In my mind, is that is, is you know it's a world class whiskey. I think it's just a fantastic whiskey. It's beautiful, but uh, you know we just need more people talking about it. How much um, liquid are you producing out of Deanston at the moment? So we're, we're dropping back a wee bit this year. So we're going under just the, the 2 million litres this year. Last year we did about 2.6. Mm. Um, so we're, we're moving purposely. We're just going through a, a wee process of, of uh, inventory correction this year. So we're making slightly less. So rather than a seven-day operation, we're, we're, we're going back down to, in fact, I've just restarted as, as a five-day operation. So running a Sunday evening through to a, to a Friday afternoon. You see, I so mean, just under you know, the Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that, when you talk about producing two million litres of, of alcohol a year, you know, it's by no means a small distillery, but no, which kind no. of, like you say, you beg his belief that it's, it's kind of relatively unknown to a lot of people, but so big a, a, a producer for the, for the blend market. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we'll, it, it, it's a significant percentage we will trade and sell, which of course we need to do because, you know, we, we have a number, um, you know, we have a number of products if, if you take into account, Scott, you know, for example, Scottish Leader or Black Bottle, mm. where we need more than three distilleries to create those blends. So we do need to do the, the, the horse trading and the, the selling and the buying and the moving around because uh, we need that as, as a business to survive ourselves. Mm. So I'm, I'm assuming then if, if a lot of your liquid is going to trade, that you are filling cask at 63 and a half? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so we, might, we, we are chatting about doing some work around that this year just to, uh, just to see perhaps if we, can, if we can tease that up a wee bit. But we probably wouldn't go because you start to extract too many notes from the wood the stronger you go, you know, but uh, because it is quite a cold and damp environment, we're, we're, we're maybe thinking we could perhaps tease that strength up, but, um, you know, we'll do some trial work first. So just sort of a, a question, obviously, because we are recording for it to go up. When you're producing the, whisk, the new mate then, you put it into cask. Are those casks kind of already put aside for blending and for the single malt, or is it just a, as you go along, you decide which ones are going where? 
Well, it, it, sometimes it'll depend, um, you know, how quickly we can get them in uh, from our suppliers. So, uh, you know, for for typically doing um, stuff for blends, we'll, we'll, we'll typically fill refill casks. Um, you know, we will have an allocation of spirit to set aside for 18 year olds which goes into refills. We'll have an allocation of spirit set aside which will go into bourbons. We will have an allocation of spirit set aside for red wine. So whilst um, and we and we try and really just flatten that out over the year, just so that we don't end up with you know a few years down the line um, where we might end up with some inventory gaps. So we try and avoid that where we possibly can. So we just try and flatten out as much as we can. And uh, and you know we 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 like I say when we bring, um, for example, bourbon or new oak in from from Kentucky, then we will we will try and fill that. We'll try and space that evenly over the year and fill it when it arrives at the site. Yeah. So it's kind of predetermined very early on as to where that spirit's going. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we, I mean, we'll typically work with a five-year plan. So we'll kind of know five years ahead of the game um, what we're filling in. Now, those managing those volumes then comes down to the distillery to do it. And let's like say we've got to try and balance off not just having, because we don't have the space at Deanston to have, you know, a thousand casks out in the yard and we just pick what we want to use in a, in a particular week. So we will just try and schedule in over the course of a month, what we want to put into refill, what we want to put into new oak, what we want to put into bourbon or red wine or whatever we happen to have to bring in. So, um, you know, it's and, and that way, working within a kind of month, you don't end up with with too many um, inventory gaps or none if you manage it properly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, has anybody else got any questions? I mean, in, in terms of the maturation, you mentioned your warehouses earlier. I mean, is all the Deanston that goes into the Deanston single malts matured there? Is it, or is it, did you have centralised warehousing as part of the, the, the bigger group? No, we try and keep, I mean, one of the things um, we, we try and do clearly, we can't do it at Tobermory because we've no warehousing there, but, but certainly at Gunahaban and Deanston, then we will try to keep as much of the material set aside for single malt matured at the, at the site. Um, you know, that, that keeps true to the story. Uh, we will we'll certainly do that for Gunahaban and, and, and again, as much as we can. We do have third party agreements. Um, Oh dear, not my earphone out. We have third party agreements with, with other distillers and we, we may well, you know, store stuff at their warehouses, but um, you know, that's mainly for blends and what have you. We'll try and keep everything true to the single malts at their at their originating sites. Which can be a bit of a headache, I have to say, but we try. Yeah, no. I mean, what I'm going to do now, because again, I am aware it's Father's Day and things like that. People yeah. don't want to hang around talking to us all day long. Um, has anybody got any final questions? Okay. Before I stop One recording? more question, Stephen. Um, your your core range uh, is is pretty kind of sparse in terms of um, age statements. You've got the, you've got the twelve and the eighteen, um, and you've kind of you've got this sort of like sort of special releases where you're doing a lot with sort of different casks and finishing and things like that. Have you got any plans to kind of expand that that age statement in the core um, range? The, 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 there is, and uh, and and you know, I, I probably won't in case I get into trouble, Ed, because you know I don't get signed <laughs> off on what I can say, and what I can't. But but you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if you were maybe to see a number popping up somewhere between 12, 12 and eighteen in the run too distant future. Um, for Deanston yeah. certainly. Um, you know, that right. the, 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 there's a piece where, um. You know, some of some of our marketing people believe that that you know people who get engaged by, by the twelve, the, the jump to eighteen may be a price point too far. Um, I mm -hmm. still happen to think the eighteen is a very good price point for an eighteen-year-old. So, agree, um, yeah, yeah, keep keep yeah keep keep your eye out for, for for a number that may appear somewhere between twelve and eighteen. I can't say any more than that. Yeah. I might get into trouble. I mean, do we <laughs> think you. that people get too hung up over age statements? Totally. Um, do you know and, and what? I think we've managed to do at Bunahaben is, is looking at things like Toy Chikada and, and, and Sturador, which are just two absolutely fantastic products. Mm -hmm. And and when we take these to uh, when we take these on the road to festivals, I'm now beginning to find that people, you know, we, we run out of the Sturador and Toy Chikada first. And mm -hmm. and the age statements are sat there. People are getting far less hung up in a number. And and you know, we encourage that. I mean it's it's for us, I mean they're great mile milestone markers to perhaps refine your taste in whiskey but um you know for for, for toy, toy chikada for example there are up to 14 year old whiskies go in there it's not just about yeah. uh, it's not just about getting as much three-year-old out the door as you possibly can 
um, and it averages out at quite a respectable age. So, um, and you know, when people taste it, it's just, you know, wow. I mean, th th these are the things that are, are really beginning to shift for us at festivals. So, um, and, and we'll bang that drum all day. Um, yeah. Absolutely bang that drum all day. It's just yeah. a real shame that, um, you know, sort of labelling laws and things like that mean that, you know, you do miss out a little bit on the kind of transparency of, of what's in those, um, yeah. you know, these, these non-age statement whiskies. I'd, I'd love to see all of that information. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd love for every whiskey to have an age statement on it, whether that's a, you know, a three-year-old or a 30-year-old. That's just me. Yeah. I mean, well, I think, that's the thing. Yeah. I think it boils down to the ethos of the companies, though, that some companies have chucked age sta non-age statements out there and then charged a bloody fortune for them. And people have, have, you know, sort of alienated the fact of no age statements. Um, but if, if the companies yeah. are true to the word and, you know, put a good quality no age statement out there and give it the proper price bracket, then it shouldn't make yeah. a difference whatsoever. Because, I mean, all, all, that's give, all that we're being told with an age statement is that's the minimum age. It, it's not a quality stamp. No, absolutely. And, and, and I think with... With 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 uh, you know we 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 with the age that has to go in the bottle as well, I think it would just put too many consumers off because we would be we would be naive to, to believe there aren't younger whiskies in there. Um, but that would have to be the stamp that would go in the bottle because uh, do you know I happen to know there are some some well aged whiskies in there, um, probably older than they should be, you know. But uh, it gives us a, a, a lovely product. Yeah. It's the same point, Stephen, to what you were saying about chill filtration and about, um, you know, that sort of highland mist that happens when, uh, you know, the, if the shop's a bit cold or something, you know, that wouldn't put, uh, uh, you know, sort of a whiskey nerd like, like, like me off. But, you know, for other people, it, it, you know, they, they misunderstand what that actually is. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly it. And it's, uh, do you know, it's, it's, it's a, I suppose it's, it's a shame, but, but do you know, the majority of the whiskey that will be sold today will be, will be chill filtered. And, and yeah. you know, likewise as well, it's, it's uh, yeah. I, I don't think, like I say, I think, you know, Sam was, was, was edging on it earlier with Dave. You know, we, we don't want to be condescending. We, we don't want to be telling people it's all about age statements. It's not, it's about enjoying your whiskey. Mm. And, you know, we, exactly. we, we are, uh, you know, as a company, do not want to tell people how to enjoy their whiskey if they want to mix it with cola or whatever they want to do. Then, absolutely, that's you know, you've you've worked hard and you've earned the money to go and buy it. Drink it how you like it. Uh, yeah, I think that's the thing as that a... you've got to get across. You know, it's it's your whiskey. If you want to drink it with ice, you know, if if you if you want to put lemonade or Coca Cola in, you know, you do what you want and you drink it your way. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's we we all buy far more expensive. Well, typically buy a lot more expensive commodities in life. Imagine buying a car and the the salesman told you how to drive it. You, yeah. You know, you, it's, you, you, no way. So, and and we're exactly the same with whiskey. You've you've worked hard. You've you've earned the money to buy it. Drink it how you enjoy it. Exactly. You know. I mean, um, what's yes. Yeah, so, I mean, what one? Oh yeah, I get it. Uh, I'm gonna say one. One of them has just said, "Can we swirl our whiskey?" Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> Do what you, know, you want with it. Yeah, you know, give it, give it a good swirl. Um, it, I mean, it all boils down to the end fact of whiskey is all about opinions. It's all about enjoying it. You know, it, it's like we said with Sam earlier that it, it's a social drink. You know, do what you want with it. It's, it's not meant to take over your life, although it does, you know, but it, it, it's, it's there to be enjoyed. Do what you want with it. And to me, anybody that preaches to you how you should drink it, shouldn't be in front of an audience that's my opinion no, no i mean we i i kind of um you know you, one of one of the lines i quite like delivering during tastings is you know you you really want to just listen you know taste with your ears almost mm -hmm. you know if, if you knows you know don't put anything in it the only thing i would ever insist is don't put anything in it for the first sip yeah appreciate the dram let the dram talk to you listen to it It'll tell you whether it wants a bit of ice in there. It'll tell you whether it wants a wee bit of water. Or it'll tell you, you know, I put some Coca-Cola in me. Um, <laughs> whatever you want, just, uh, you know, just enjoy it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the, kind of only, the only plead the, 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 that I would ever ask people is just have a, a wee drop of it neat and, yeah. let it, and just listen to it. Yeah, it, Soren, it, it's, it. That, um, it's that story that you were telling about the, the bloke at the, uh, at the whiskey festival uh, where he was carrying around a bottle of Coke with him. Yeah, and uh, and everyone was absolutely shocked 
that yeah. he was like, well, actually, I'm not a whiskey drinker, so this is how I enjoy it. Yeah. But, you know, he was at this whiskey festival just, just having Coke with it, and it was, yeah, yeah. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is it, and I mean, you know, we, we all know the fact of when you visit a distillery and you take a sip of a whiskey at a distillery, it always tastes 10 times better than when you get it home. And if you sit on your own and drink it, you sometimes think to yourself, do you know, this just doesn't taste the same. But again, you, you know, you could get two or three friends sat around a table with you and you pour it again and it's like, it, it's taking you back to that distillery again because it's yeah. a social drink. That's it. It's, it's the subjectivity of the, the, the drink. I mean, again, you know, I've done tastings fairly recently. There's a lot of this stuff now happening online where, do you know, it, it's... When the, the original tasting notes were done, it might have been December, it might have been raining, it might have been in the, the south of the country where, you know, I'm now doing a tasting at home in Speyside and it's June and it's sunny and how that, how that whiskey will behave in my mouth is completely different to how it did six months ago. So I'll tend to do another, another load of, uh, of, of notes on it just, to, just to, 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 to talk to the tasting in that particular day. And I, I think you're right, and Sam alluded to it as well. It's a bit... The mood you're in, it's about where you are, it's about the company you're keeping, it's, you know, you're having it before a meal, after a meal, it all kicks into just, you know, the, 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 the whiskey comes down to the mood in the moment, and, uh, yeah. you know, I, I couldn't subscribe to that more. And I think you kind of hit on something perfect there, where, you know, as a consumer side of things, that if we're buying a, a whiskey, to me, yeah, it's nice to have those tasting notes on the bottle, but you've got to remember that is somebody's opinion that is that is yeah. their story that is their memories and we've yeah. got one or two people on the forum um maybe not in today but you know from from different countries and things like that and their their illusions to what it tastes like are totally different to say mine yeah. because they've tasted different foods or they've tasted different yeah. ways it's you know and and there's so much emphasis on you have got to remember it's an opinion and nobody's yeah. opinion is ever wrong yeah, that, that, you're exactly right. It's subjective. It's absolutely subjective. And, and that, that's the piece for me is that no one in a tasting, and I do it all the time because, again, I'm not a fan of these, you know, 10 pages of, of tasting notes. There might be one or two things, but it all distills down to one or two things. You either like it or you don't. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It's, uh, you either like it or you don't. And, uh, do you know, so, so, so that's kind of, and, and, but you're right. I mean, I, I, I really engage in conversation with an American lady one time. And it was, uh, I can't remember what the drama was, but, but it was a Dean so it was certainly non PT, and she started talking about smoke. And I'm kind of getting a wee bit lost in this conversation because, of course, I know fine there's no smoke in it. Mm. But what she was referring to, the mouthfeel, the taste I've got here is if I have just had a, a smoke, a cigar almost, and I, yeah. I don't smoke, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tune into the note. But suddenly it wasn't a conversation about peat. It was a yeah. conversation about tobacco, you know? So, um, ah, it's... it's the, that's right. No one's wrong. Is is no. Yeah. Can I sum this up? No one is wrong. Um, I mean, what we'll do now is any last questions. Um, otherwise, I'll stop the recording. I'll, I've got one. Go on, go on, go on Chris. Um, just basically covering your last distillery, I suppose. Um, I was just wondering what the split between the Tobermory and Lechik, uh production is. It, it, it can vary from year to year. Um, we, we will try, um, it's very boring, but we'll try and, and go for about a 60, a 50-50 a a split. Um, it, it really just kind of depends where we've we'll got some very, very clever people who sit and, and do things with Excel spreadsheets that I couldn't even begin to imagine. And we'll, we'll, we'll forward plan where we think sales are going to go. But it'll never, ever exceed any more than maybe 60, 40, either way. Um, we, we are falling heavily in the side of Leitchik this year. Um, but that's what the, 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 the clever people with spreadsheets seem to think that the inventory is going to need moving forward. So um, it's, it's, we, we can keep it tight. If it was a really, if, if we were left, we know people, we know spreadsheets. It's typically a quarter on, a quarter off. So, 50-50. It's as boring as that, sadly. <laughs> Go on, Andy. Yeah, cheers, mate. Um, firstly, Steve, thanks for coming on, mate. I'm a massive fan of Deanston. It's kind of no my worries. guilty fanboy distillery, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so, just going back to what you were saying before, and Ed, Ed, I think it was Ed that brought up the point around uh, age statements, and it kind of ties in with what you were saying before about wanting to get more people drinking Deanston. Mm -hmm. Um, I've I've seen a couple of bits and pieces online and on Twitter um, around 
a release that's been released initially. I think it's Morrison's in Scotland called Dean's yeah. Kentucky Cask. Kentucky, yeah. Um, so I, I appreciate them from what I understand. It's a lower percentage. It's sort of taken away from, from the core range, so to speak, in the sense of the 46.3 down to 40. Yeah. It's got a very bright red label and it's, it does stand out on the shelf. Is that kind of what you're sort of like trying to set up to get more people into Deanston? Is that sort of like the, the introduction to it? Is that, is that sort of like the target market, so to speak? You're spot on. I mean, it, it is really just trying to hook people um, into Deanston. Now, do you know, we, we, we've, it's kind of one of these ones where I am involved in some of these earlier meetings with, 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 with marketing types. And, and you know, I think, um, you know, Virgin Oak was there almost as that hook, but we've, we've almost kind of gone a price point down again. I mean, Virgin Oak is still, um, you know, it still sticks with the story in so far as 46.3 and, you know, the, the, the non-chill filter. Um, and, and yeah, Deanston, Kentucky is just quite simply a, a bit more mainstream. It's as simple as that. You know, the deals with Morrison's at the minute, whether or not it'll, uh, it'll spread out um, a wee bit more, but we're certainly done a lot of work in the inventory just to make sure that we've, in the event it does, um, you know, we've got enough juice at its back to, to follow it up. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Have, have you tried it at all? I've not, to be honest, mate. Um, I think it's, um, it's Scotland originally, isn't it? Or initially, should I say? Um, uh, or right, you know what? I, I think you're right. I think it is, yes. So, um, so yeah, I would, but I'd probably like Dominic Cummings. I don't want to go over the border just to go to Morrison's, to be honest. Um, but, but yeah, I am genuinely looking at, like looking forward to it coming down here. Because um, right. it's, it's one of those things, you go into supermarkets and you see usual suspects, and I always think like, you know, I do have a massive soft spot for Deanston. Like I said, I'm a bit of a bit of a fanboy for it. I'm like, yeah, go on. Just just something yeah. that'll slot in there. And yeah, you know, people will buy and, and get that kind of like brand recognition out there a bit more. So it's probably the right move to be fair. So um, I mean, I, I, I've read some of it. I mean, it is mixed reviews. You know, some people like yeah. the liquid. It, it kind of taps into to, to a lot of the, um, it, it, it taps into the inventory that we use around Virgin Oaks. So it's that kind of, um, it's that kind of flavor profile. But again, you know, there's there's been the piece where there's been criticism coming down to, to 40%. Um, you know, it's a bit paler in color as well. But again, um, you know, we don't add any, uh, we don't add any color to it. So, um, and clearly the price point, slightly younger whiskies in there as well so that the color the, you know the color won't have had time to develop in the cask either but uh but you know what we're, we're pleased with it we, you know i think we've, we've done something that um uh, reflects deanston at a price point hopefully that'll, that'll hook, hook some consumers it seems to be going quite well some of the feedback i've had seems to be that it's it's moving quite well through Morrison's. so we'll, we'll see how it goes I mean, I don't know whether you picked up from that, Stephen, but you know, Andy is a big fanboy of Deanston. He just yeah. get giddy, and when we told him you were coming on, you know, it was like you could see you could see the excitement in his face. Um, but <laughs> I should really. really try and get him. A, yeah, I can't. Ignore. Look, you can see the big smile on his face now. You know, now we're talking about him. Um, it's, but, yeah. it's always great to hear from Stephen. You know, it you're is, such yeah. a passionate guy, Stephen, and you know we we love talking to to people like you. You've got a lot of knowledge to oh, share, yeah. so thank you for coming. Absolutely, I'm no, um, no problem. Any last questions? No. Right. What I'll do now, Stephen, um, I'll end the recording and just say thank you very much for coming on. Really appreciate yeah. it. Um, always love talking to you. You know, can't yeah. wait to get back down to Deanston. Um, so. Uh, visit us. Yeah. Visit us soon. No, an absolute pleasure. Sorry. Yeah. yeah.